to get our economy back on the right track. This government is demonstrating its commitment to making those decisions. And of course, uh, as a consequence, uh, interest rates are lower than they would have been if we hadn't taken those tough decisions. That's good for families and it's good for businesses. Order. A point of order, Mr. Hillary Benn. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, the House is only too well aware of the uh, mess that the government has made in the handling of the Health and Social Care Bill. But today's order paper reveals that they are now, I have to say, outrageously and desperately trying to deny the House the right to decide whether it wishes to recommit the whole of the bill to committee. So could you confirm, Mr Speaker, that the Leader of the House's motion for tonight would not only specifically prevent any amendment on the form of recommittal being taken on the Health Secretary's motion tomorrow, for example, an amendment to recommit the whole bill, but would also mean that if tonight's motion were to be objected to, then there would be no debate at all tomorrow on recommittal. Now, in order to prevent this uh, and protect the rights of members, Mr Speaker, I wonder whether it is possible for you uh, to establish a programming committee understanding Order 83B to meet and pass a resolution today that might enable us to have a proper debate tomorrow with amendments by invoking one of the exceptions in Standing Order 83A to the motion being taken forthwith? And could you also, as to the form of the debate tomorrow, advise whether if the Leader's business motion is passed tonight, it will be in order for members tomorrow to argue in the debate that the whole of the bill be recommitted, especially as a motion in the name of the Leader of the Opposition calling for precisely that has been on the order paper since the 24th of May. Order, I'm grateful to the Shadow Leader of the House for his point of order and for advance notice of it. The Right Honourable Gentleman has raised a series of very important matters to which I think it is important both for him and for the House that I should respond. I'll try to deal... Well, if the Honourable Gentleman will allow me to deal with the point of order from the Right Honourable Gentleman, Shadow Leader of the House, and remains dissatisfied, of course I will treat of any ensuing point of order. First of all, let me say that the Right Honourable Gentleman is correct in supposing that if the business of the House motion is objected to tonight, the programme number two motion would be put without debate or opportunity for amendment tomorrow. That is, as a matter of procedure, factually correct. The programme number two motion would be put without debate, as are all such motions varying or supplementing a programme order unless they fall into one of the four exceptions listed in standing order number 83 a. The motion to be moved tomorrow is not covered by any of those exceptions and so would ordinarily be put forthwith. <coughs> Secondly, there will indeed be no opportunity to move amendments. If the Business of the House motion is agreed tonight, the programme number two motion will be debated for an hour tomorrow, indeed up to an hour, but no amendments may be moved. The same applies if the motion is being taken forthwith in accordance with Standing Order No. 83A. It would still be open <coughs> to members to table such amendments today to appear on the order paper tomorrow, but either way, under our procedures, they could not be moved. The Right Honourable Gentleman asked the very important question of whether it would be in order on the programme number two motion debate tomorrow to argue that the whole bill and not just the clauses specified should be recommitted, to which the explicit answer is yes. It would be possible to argue that more or less of the bill ought to be recommitted or, of course, to argue against recommittal altogether. I understand the Right Honourable Gentleman's concern on this matter as a whole, and specifically he referred to the position that the Leader of the Opposition had set out last month, but the House is not being asked to agree anything which is out of order. It is for the House to decide upon the motions before it, and with reference to the particular question of a programming committee, what I would say to the Right Honourable Gentleman and to the House is that the standing order relating to the programming committee would apply only to proceedings on the floor of the House, and the initial programme order of the 31st of January specifically excluded the operation of the programming committee on this bill. Whether my response is welcome or 
unwelcome to different members in the various parts of the House. I hope members will accept that it is fully thought through and the response is offered on the basis of the standing orders of the House. Of course, of course I'll take a follow-up point of order from the shadow leader. Mr Hillary Benn. Speaker, I'm extremely grateful to you for that uh, comprehensive response. Uh, but further to the point of order I uh, raised, is it not, it is indeed the case that the programming motion on the health and social care bill passed on the 31st of January disapplied uh, standing order 83B, which relates to programming committees, only in relation to consideration and third reading. It doesn't apply to committee stage. Now, if that is the case, then could not the programming committee, by the device of now suggesting a committee of the whole House, bring the matter within scope, and therefore, even if that committee of the whole House were not to be agreed tomorrow, would ensure, one, there would be a debate, and two, that we could take amendments. The right honourable gentleman is saying, but the programme motion relates to, as I understand it, the proceedings on the floor of this House. And I think that the right honourable gentleman is in some difficulty if he's praying it in aid in support of the proposition that he's just making. If I'm mistaken, no doubt I'll be advised. And if the right honourable gentleman doesn't think that I have fully seized the gravamen of his point, he's welcome to return to it because these are important matters. But that's the best initial response that I can offer. Point of order, Mr Peter Bone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following on to those point of order, and thank you for your very careful um, explanation. But would I be right in thinking that if the um, Business of the House motion was objected to tonight, the government would not necessarily have to bring forward its substantive motion tomorrow, and the government could have a rethink. The Honourable Gentleman, as so often, is right. He's absolutely right. There's no obligation on the government to bring forward its motion. The government is perfectly at liberty to test the will of the House. But as to the organisation of government business, well, that's a matter entirely for the government. If the government wants to take note of who votes which way or that or decides to sleep on the matter and reconsider, I entertain no special prospect of that happening. But if that's what's in ministers' minds, that's a matter for ministers. Uh, and note what the right honourable gentleman says about a lawn tennis championship taking place not far from here, but it's not entirely obvious to me how relevant that is to ministers thinking on this matter. We're grateful to him, nevertheless. Point of order, Mr Tom Blenkins. Mr Speaker, is it in order for the government to seek to stop members putting down amendments to a programming motion, uh, and indeed to stop you, in effect, from deciding whether you wish to select any particular amendment? And do you have any idea what the government is so afraid of? It is for the House to decide to what it agrees. That, that's a matter for the House. People are perfectly free to do what is legitimate within the procedures of the House. That's up to them. Um, whatever attempt may be made to persuade them of the merits of one course or an action or another, but ultimately it is then a matter for the House. Mr Graham Morris. Point. I'm grateful, Mr Speaker, and, and just to support those points and to, to, uh, to seek a little further clarification. I, I'm certainly not suggesting, Mr Speaker, the Government are trying to stifle debate, but it isn't clear to the House whether the Government have sought to prevent amendments to the, commission, to the committal motion for the Health and Social Care Bill by accident or design. But can you confirm, Mr Speaker, that the Government can still change its mind today by moving the motion tonight without the last section? That's the section that prevents amendments being taken. The answer to the Honourable Gentleman off the top of my head is that the Government, if it were moved by the power of the Honourable Gentleman's argument or the eloquence of its expression, would be perfectly free to change its mind and probably the way it would do so if it were so minded would be the conventional method in these circumstances, namely not moving the motion on the order paper. If the Leader of the House is a fair-minded man, happens to be swayed by the Honourable Gentleman's observations or those of others, it's perfectly open to him and others to decide not to move the Government's motion. So I hope I've made the position clear. It might just be helpful if I say in response to the shadow leader, by way of clarification, that the terms of the programme motion do not apply to, they do not embrace the proceedings in a public bill committee. 
and indeed, as I'm helpfully advised, the deliberations of the programming committee don't apply to that section of the consideration by the House. They apply elsewhere, but they don't cover that element of the proceeding. So, insofar as there is any different interpretation, it might relate to a difference of interpretation as to what the competence of that programming subcommittee is. But I hope I have explained the factual position about what it is responsible yeah. for and what it is not. Point of order, Mr Stuart Hosey. Further to that uh, uh, last answer, Mr Speaker, um, I'm not sure where this will lead the Labour Party or others in the debate tonight or possibly tomorrow. I am concerned, however, that this uncertainty now may lead to the time protected for the Scotland Bill being eroded or eaten into, and I'm seeking clarification from yourself or others that that will remain protected. Well, there's a lot to be said for seeing what transpires, and I know that the Honourable Gentleman is a keen student of political history. Perhaps he'll agree with me in this context that it's a good idea to remember the wise words of the late Lord Whitelaw. He it was who said, as a rule, I do not believe in crossing bridges until I come to them. Uh, point of order, Mr Dennis Skinner. This all started because the government said it was going to listen. Yeah. That's what it was all about. Yeah. Have you stopped listening? <laughs> come on. I fear that the Honourable Gentleman, perhaps not for the first time and possibly not for the last, has taken matters a little outside my <laughs> capacity to rule. But he's nevertheless spurred the leader, and the leader must be heard. Further to that point of order, it is precisely because the government has listened that we have tabled the motion tonight to enable a debate to take place tomorrow. Had we not tabled such a motion, under standing orders, the recommittal motion would have been proceeded with forthwith. I'm grateful to the Leader of the House, who I think has clarified matters very satisfactorily. Well, I'm sure it's an unrelated point that the Right Honourable Gentleman wants to raise. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Given, given, given that this motion is crucial to the survival of the Coalition, if the, House follow, if the House follows the advice that you were given to them, you gave to the Honourable Gentleman Member for Wellingborough, it does mean that we'd soon get another motion on the order paper, doesn't it? Well, I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Gentleman. My response to that is twofold. First of all, the question is hypothetical. And secondly, the survival of the coalition, as the Right Honourable Gentleman Member of 32 <coughs> years standing can well testify, is thankfully not a matter for me one way or t'other. <laughs> if the point of order appetite has been exhausted, perhaps we can now proceed to the main business.